Hey guys, um, we are celebrating something really exciting this morning because we have a baptism. And we gather here every Sunday because we believe that God the Father sent his son who came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, and then rose again, allowing us to enter into relationship and eternal life with him. And there is somebody here that has found hope in him because of that. And uh, we are so excited to celebrate the step of baptism of her declaring Jesus as her Lord and Savior today. So if you guys can welcome Emily up to seat with me. Yay, Emily. I just I just love Emily, and I have seen her walk with and follow Jesus in this past few years, and so I'm so excited for her to share a little bit of her story with you. Good morning, United. <laughs> My name's Emily. I've been coming um, to United for a little over a year now. I'm one of the Stevenson girls that sits behind the Wolf family. <laughs> I am a part of Leah and Rachel's small group in Leah's discipleship study. I want to thank Leah and Rachel for being the best united leaders. I also want to thank Morgan for praying for me um, to walk with Christ and for always, sorry, for always answering my questions when I'm confused about something in my readings. I am blessed and thankful for you guys. I grew up Catholic, so I was dedicated as a baby, but I'm so excited to be standing up here today proclaiming my love for Jesus as I take my next step in my walk with Christ as I get baptized today. All right, so you're going to repeat after me. Yeah, you're perfect. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And he is. And he is. The Lord and Savior of my life. The Lord and Savior of my life. <laughs> because of your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> All right, we're going to uh, pray over Emily together. So if you guys can just reach out your hands and we'll pray over her together. Lord, we thank you so much for Emily. We thank you for um, this profession of faith that she has made this morning. Jesus, we praise you that you did come and die on the cross and rise again for us. And we just thank you that Emily has declared you as the Lord and Savior over her life today. And we just pray that she will continue to follow you all of the days of her life and as a church, Lord, that we would help her do that, that we would come alongside her as your body, and that we would seek you together. So Lord, we just pray your blessing over Emily and this day. So we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, good morning, church family. I can't think of a better way to start off um, a Sunday morning than with a baptism. Um, here at United, we like to say that we're all about helping people know and follow Jesus. And so getting to celebrate somebody decide that they want to follow Jesus with their life is really just the best thing that we can do. So let's just clap one more time. Um, really, really excited. Um, I'm Lori Ann. I'm part of the team here, and I'm just going to let you guys know about a couple things that we have going on. Um, when you first came in, you should have sat down probably on um, one of our Connect cards. Um, we fill these out every week. It's just a great way for us to know that you're here and for you to note um, if there's a question that you have or a next step that you'd like to take or if there's a way that we can be praying for you. We have a team that meets every week to pray over those requests. Um, so please share those there and fill one out. Um, you can either drop that in the little drop box on your way out or um, if you're new and it's your first time we're so excited that you decided to join us this morning and so we'd love to have you take that card to the black tent um, and we have a free gift for you and we just love to meet you um, 
A couple of other things. So with your Connect card, you should have also gotten a flyer here for our food drive. So we've been talking about this the last couple of weeks. Um, we've done food drives in the past, and a lot of the times we um, hang bags like on doors in the community and invite the community to participate. And this year we decided that we really wanted to um, just encourage and equip all of you to um, connect with your family, your neighbors, and your coworkers, and anybody else who's in your circles and invite them to participate and be generous and be a part of our food drive. Um, so the final um, day or the final week to kind of get all of that going is this week. So we're going to be bringing all of the food next Sunday. So if you've been collecting food, I know some people have, the Stevenson students have like piles in their dorms. Um, so we know people have been collecting food. So make sure that you bring that next Sunday. Um, and if you are able to, we'd love to have a few people come early and help out because we're going to need some help organizing all of the food. Um, and we'll also need some help after school service as well with organizing that. So if you can come a little bit early, stay a little bit late, that would be great. And it's not going to be hard to stay late because we're going to have food for you. It's also going to be tailgate Sunday. Um, so uh, every month or so, we like to extend the Sunday and just spend some time um, fellowshipping together and sharing a meal together. And um, we're going to be doing that next Sunday. We're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs. We're asking everyone to bring a side. We're going to play flag football. And you should wear your team gear, whatever your team is. A lot of people in here are wearing their Ravens gear today. But whoever your team is for whatever sport, if you have a team, if you like sports, if you don't like sports, um, you should definitely come out. I am like the person who was always picked like last for gym class and I'm going to be playing flag football <laughs> next week. So everyone should wear their sneakers, tennis shoes, their team stuff and come prepared to play and be excited about it. <laughs> um, so we'll be doing that next Sunday as well. Um, and then I think that is just about everything. Um, it's a really great Sunday to invite people too. So invite anybody who maybe gave to your food drive, invite them to come out and bring the food with you and then stay and have a meal with us and play flag football. So it'll be a great Sunday to invite people out to as well. Um, we are going to take just a quick break here. Um, we do this every Sunday. Um, you can grab coffee. The kids are going to head back to their environment. So if, if you have an elementary age or below child, um, they're going to head over to their rooms in the other building. If this is your first time here, uh, we encourage you to walk over there with them, meet their leaders. Um, and then when you see the video start to play, we'll all head back to our seats. So yeah, break. <laughs> Well, good morning, United. Let me try it one more time. Good morning, United. You have an extra hour of sleep. It should definitely be a much louder good morning than any other Sunday in, in the year. So did anybody enjoy that extra hour of sleep? Who wasted it away and stayed up later? All right, so a couple, couple of us did that. Um, did anybody look at the clock this morning and feel like you were late for church? Because clocks didn't change like oh no I'm running late because you're seeing it like 9 30 when it's actually 8 30 you didn't all your clocks didn't automatically reset I, I don't like doing that for the first day um, but uh, make sure I want to encourage you guys Lorianne talked about the food drive I'm going to talk about it too because we have lots of these I grabbed the whole stack I'm, we have a soccer game that I'm a coach of uh, this Sunday or t today after church I'm going to go and I'm going to hand these out to all the kids on my team and Sean Connolly and I coached together a team and so we're going to invite them to participate in the food drive I challenge you to do the same thing whether it's a soccer team whether it's a company that you work with whether it's your neighbors invite people along Lo people love to do good in our community and this definitely does doesn't benefit our church at all. It benefits Owings Mills High School and elementary students that are food insecure. So we'd love for you to jump on board with that. Um, be generous yourselves, but also invite other people um, to be generous. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, it's not really a trivia question. Um, you can consider it a trivia question. It's really open-ended. Um, and I'm curious to see who you think is the best-selling author, like the, the best-selling author of all time. So any, any guesses, just shout out like an author, maybe it's your favorite... 
Dr. Seuss? All right, Dr. Seuss is close. So uh, he's got like 650 million books that he has sold. So he's close. He's not the most. What, anybody, any other guesses? J.K. Rowling. So another person that is close, uh, but Dr. Seuss sold more. So um, she uh, had 500 million. Anybody else? C.S. Lewis? Um, no, not quite. So... God, all right, all right, you super spiritual people. Goodness gracious. All right, so yeah, God did sell a lot of books. If you don't have one of his books, please grab one. Um, so that, that's a reminder. Uh, so we have extra Bibles, and I'm dead serious. If you don't have one, get up right now. Don't feel awkward. Grab a Bible because you're going to be lost if you don't have one as we're listening. Any other guesses? Super spiritual people, thank you. Other, like, modern books? Tolkien, okay. Say it again. Stephen King's definitely up there. Say that again? No? All right, so here, here's Shakespeare is like up there. Five or four billion. Uh, Agatha Christie, anybody ever read an Agatha Christie book? So also four billion. Um, Danielle Steele, you're probably not going to want to admit reading one of her books, but um, 800 million. Uh, but here is, here is the, the winner. Um, you probably never heard of this dude before in your life. I don't even think I could say his name. Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong, I failed history class, obviously. So, all right. So communist leader of China for 30 years in the 20th century. Um, so I don't think people were, were, you know, were willingly buying his book. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, so 6.5 billion um, copies of just one of several books that he wrote. He has close to 10 billion books that have been published. And uh, so he's, according to at least one um, survey that's out there, he is the leader. But I would also say, so you super spiritual people were on to me. Um, uh, today, we're moving through the Bible in the year. And I'm not going to say the Bible, um, uh, but as we go through the story of the Bible, we started at the very beginning in January, and we're wrapping up actually at the end of this month uh, in the book of Revelation. And we're going to be wrapping up uh, the whole Bible in a year. And when I think about one of the best-selling authors, uh, it's not necessarily God. God is the writer of the Bible, but he uh, gives us his words through people. Um, and one of those people uh, that we're going to talk about as we go through the Bible in a year, we're not going to, if you're not familiar with the story of the Bible, we're not going to like catch everybody up in a, a quick five-minute version. But we're after Jesus right now in this story. Jesus died, he was risen from the dead, and the church starts. And so we've been in the book of Acts. And in part of the book of Acts, there's a, a prominent character that comes um, to the surface, and his name is Paul. Paul wrote 13 books in the Bible. So if you do the math, um, 13 books that he wrote, and there's well over 6 billion copies of the Bible that have been sold. That's like 78 billion. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to advocate that the Apostle Paul might be one of the most influential writers of all time. Uh, and he's probably the most quoted. Um, even if you're like, oh, I just want to stick to Jesus, uh, you still probably quote him in a wedding ceremony. Um, you still probably will go to some of his writings, um, even if you're just trying to stick to Jesus. He, he's so influential um, that he gives a lot of direction to how the church should be organized. Um, and he's written 13, what they're called letters, we call them books, but they're actually letters to churches, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about, as we move forward in this story, the, the book of the Bible that we've been in the most is this book called Acts, and it's called Acts because it's the Acts of the Apostles, meaning what these first followers of Jesus did to start the church, and so we've been learning a little bit about that, but the story takes a major shift in focusing on these kind of heroes like Paul and James and John and Peter um, and these really influential guys to where Paul starts to, as he writes these letters to different churches, and so when you open up your Bible and you see this, those books like Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, like you see these different, they're letters to churches. So it's almost as if today it, there would be a letter to the church in Baltimore. And it was just like, hey, this is a letter to people who live in Baltimore and Baltimore suburbs. Uh, and those are similar to what's happening there. He's just writing a letter um, to those. But one of the things that takes place in this shift is it goes from talking about the acts of the apostles to acts that everybody who follows Jesus should participate in. And it starts to talk about the church in a different way. It's not talking about the church as Paul's church or Peter's church. Um, Paul did start 13 churches directly and many more indirectly. So he's one of the pioneers of starting churches in the New Testament. Um, but he starts to talk about 
you know, the, the church is a group of people. And he starts to address letters this way. And, and so he says to one church, the saints who are in Ephesus. And so the church in his mind is, is not, you know, David Platt's church in Ephesus. It's, no, it's the saints who are in Ephesus. And then he says the church of God in Corinth. And so it's not Stephen Furtick's church of Corinth. It's the church of God, meaning people. There's like hundreds of you, not one of you that represents the church. Or to all who are in Rome and loved by God and called to be saints. So it's like not Tim's church united um, that he started as if I did this on my own. And oftentimes, we're not going to start to police our language about like, hey, you can't call it this person's church or that person's church. But there's a, there's a shift in the New Testament where it ta- starts to think about the church as it's not just the acts of the apostles and these amazing men. It's the acts of everybody who follows Jesus. Each and every person is a part of this story now. The story of the Bible invites anybody who follows Jesus Christ to now be a part of the story going on. And so the question that I have for you as we think about, hey, we're all the church. Anybody who follows Jesus and says, like we heard this morning, um, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Uh, Anybody who does that and makes that commitment and statement in their life is now part of the church. But my question is, are you a renter or an owner in the church? It says, are you a renter? Now, that's kind of like an odd question. Like, you think about buying a basketball team. It's like one person comes and puts the cash down for, to buy that basketball team. Is it the same thing with church? Like, somebody just comes in and buys United up, and United stock goes up? No, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. I'm talking about, this is how I'm thinking about being an owner versus a renter of a church. Um, raise your hand if you rent. Or raise your hand if you've ever rented before. All right, a hand of us rent. Raise your hand if a kid who lives with a parent. So... Some of you were homeless as a kid. All right, so, all right, all right. So all of us have lived and had the benefits. And when we think about being a renter, when Maria and I um, first got married, uh, we lived in an apartment together. Many of you live in an apartment right now. When something breaks, what's the first thing you do? You call somebody, you don't, you don't have to, you don't fix it, right? So uh, maybe it's something simple enough that you fix, but you don't fix it. You call somebody up and you say, hey, uh, the dishwasher's broken, come fix it. And they come and they send somebody over and they fix it. Well, when I bought a home, I bought a house at 23 years old. And so we moved into a house and and I noticed the difference pretty quickly of being an owner and a renter. When that appliance broke, I didn't just call anybody up and like, come on over and fix it because it was mine. It was my problem now. I'm responsible for this. And so, but I did call somebody up. Um, he, he's, his name is Dad. Uh, and, uh, and so I would call Dad up. Dad, come on over and help me out. But here's the thing. I was still on the hook if there was a part that needed to be bought or if there was something that needed to be fixed. I was still on the hook to buy that item uh, at the store to be able to do that. And maybe my dad could figure it out or my dad and I, I shouldn't say my dad and I, my dad could figure it out and I would watch him. And, um, but uh, if it was a project that was over his head, I had to call somebody else. That was expensive to call. Just for them to come was like $100, and they didn't even fix anything yet. They were just telling me what the problem was. So if you're an owner, you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, And it's completely different. Why? Because as an owner, you're actively responsible for maintaining your house. As a renter, you don't care. It breaks. It's not my problem. I'm not paying for this. That's included in my rent, right? Well, how do you approach church? Are you actively responsible for the things that happen in the organization of a church? Whatever church is your church, if you're visiting United this morning, you might have another church that's your church, or if United is your church, are you actively responsible for, hey, we don't have enough people to take care of kids on Sunday morning? Are you thinking, oh, call somebody up, they'll come in and do it. Are you thinking, no, that's me. I play a part in making sure I serve this church community. Or, see, there's renter mentalities and there's owner mentalities. And so I'm not just talking about Sunday, too. I'm talking about the way that we live our lives throughout the week. And as we move through the book of Acts, and as we go through these letters, the shift takes place from Peter and Paul and all these awesome guys preaching amazing sermons. They're not trying to get more followers, you know, like, and like download more messages, like I'm awesome. They're trying to say, you start to do these things, and I want to show that to you. So open up the Bible to the book of Romans. If you have one of the Bibles that you borrowed from one of these high top tables, that's going to be on page 553. 
And as you go to the book of Romans, you're gonna go to chapter 15. And you're gonna start to see right away um, this shift that takes place from, you know, uh, Paul, who writes this book thinking that like, hey, people are like following me and coming to my churches to what's more important for him as we look at Romans 15. And if you're in Romans 15, go to verse 14 is where we're gonna start. And Paul says these words. He says, I myself am convinced. So Romans chapter 15, verse 14. My brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge. He's not saying I'm full of goodness. I have lots of knowledge. I'm the teacher and writer of all these books. He's saying, you actually have the same things. And here's what else. You're competent to instruct one another. Did you ever think that this was your job description as a member of a church? To teach somebody else? No, no, I'm supposed to go. Tim's supposed to tell me everything. He feeds me, right? Um, he tells me what I'm supposed to do, what I'm supposed to believe, um, how I'm supposed to act as a Christian. That's, that's church, right? No, that's not church. That's a part of church. You, you need to be taught by people who are good teachers, and I'm not a good teacher, but um, hopefully there's other teachers in your life, and hopefully you're friends with them in this room because you're competent to instruct one another. Paul is not promoting his YouTube channel. He's not trying to get more clicks and more likes. He is trying to get more people to do what he's doing with them. The same way I'm teaching you, you now teach one another. If you've learned and if you've grown, now help somebody else to learn and grow. This is our goal at United. Lorianne said it when she said, hey, we're all about helping one another to know and love Jesus, to know and follow Jesus. That's what we're all about. And that's what we want. And the way that works best is when all of us take an active role in that. And so Paul is really clear, like, this is what an ownership looks like. So this is one of the first steps of being an owner and not a renter is like, hey, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do this with my kids. I don't depend on a kid's program or a youth program. As a parent, I, I teach my kids. Um, I'm supposed to teach my friends, and my friends are supposed to teach me. Like, we have an influence in each other's lives. And he goes on, look at, look at verse 15, excuse me. Yet I've written to you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again. And because of the grace of God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, he gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So real quick question right here. So Paul's taking a shift. He's saying, this is what it looks like to be an owner. But he's starting to talk about his life here. And as he talks about his life here, what's he saying he's supposed to do? He says it twice. Just look there. See if you can figure out what he thinks God told him he's supposed to do. He's supposed to be a what? A minister to who? He's Jewish. So Jewish men don't typically go and teach Gentile men um, in that culture. They typically hang out in synagogues um, and they, they teach one another about God. But he is a Jewish man who is called by God to a specific role to be a minister to Gentiles. Um, and uh, let's read on. Let's continue to read in verse 17. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey what I have said and done by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce the Bible when I'm a pastor, um, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. You, let me see, read that one more time. It's always been his ambition, his desire, to preach the gospel where Jesus was not known. That's why he's going to Gentiles. He's, he's specifically trying to talk about God and about this, this monotheistic God and who sent his son Jesus uh, to save the world. And so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. So he, real quick here, let me help you understand what's happening. So Paul is, because the language changes pretty drastically, right? All of a sudden we go from being an owner to Paul's talking about himself a lot here. Look at all the statements. My service accomplished through me. I fully proclaim. I'm a minister. He gave me. Seems like Paul's talking a lot about himself, right? Well, here's why that's important. He knows what God's called him to do in being an owner of the church. Do you know what God's called you to do in being an owner of a church? And he's comparing himself to a couple other guys because there's another guy named Apollos and there's some debate in one of the books of the Bible called 1 Corinthians where they're like, hey, I follow, you know, Apollos and I follow Paul and I follow this guy and everybody's excited about who they follow. And he's like, who the heck cares about who you follow? We should all be following Jesus and stop getting excited about a leader. Um, and, 
And he compares himself to this guy, Apollos, because Paul's a pioneer. He goes and he starts new churches. He's like a startup, you know, expert. He knows how to start up a business, but the business is a church. Uh, Apollos isn't a startup guy. Apollos goes after something has been started and he takes over that church. And so there's a different calling. Uh, And then Peter, he talks about Peter doesn't leave Jerusalem. And when Paul's writings, we're not going to go through all of them, he's identifying people know what they're supposed to do. Paul was clear on what he was supposed to do in his ownership in the mission of the church. Peter was, Apollos was, all these characters that as you read through the New Testament, you start to understand. My question for you is, are you clear what you're supposed to do. If you follow Jesus Christ and you've stated that he is your Lord and Savior, do you have the clarity that Paul has? And you might think, well, Paul, like, you just introduced him as the most influential writer. Uh, Like, hopefully he has some clarity on what he's supposed to do for God. Like, are we supposed to have the same type of clarity that Paul has? We are, and we can with two questions. Two questions will help us to know what kind of clarity we can have as a follower of Jesus, to know what our purpose in the world is. What is my purpose that God has given me? Um, And and that first question is, what is God's purpose in the world? And so look back to what we're reading together. We can answer that question with Paul's example because he has lots of clarity here. In verse 20, he says, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Jesus was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. So he's going to these new areas where nobody has heard about Jesus before, but rather as it was written. And so for Paul's clarity, this is where he gets our clarity, and this is where you and I can get our clarity too. He quotes a guy named Isaiah from the Old Testament. We talked about Isaiah months ago. And the prophet Isaiah says this, says, those who are not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. Prophet Isaiah is giving a worldview to people who believe in God and believe that God sent Jesus to the world. The worldview for us to have and to live life and to see life through this lens is that God wants everybody to know Jesus. That's God's greatest burden for people in the world. It's not just, you know, you find out your purpose. You know, a lot of times when we're saying, hey, what's my purpose in life? Oh, it's to be a lawyer or to be a doctor. or I'm going to be a teacher uh, or I want to be a, a husband or a dad or a mom. Or, you know, like, and we have all these different labels and titles and our purpose can be viewed through the lens of what we do. And Paul is saying our purpose should be viewed through the lens of who we point people to. Not what we do, but who we believe in, and that is God. The bigger picture of our life. So when you're thinking about what's the purpose of my life, you're going to have a real hard time figuring that out if you don't have this baseline understanding of God wants people who don't see him to see him. God wants people who don't understand who he is to hear about and to understand who he is in verse 21. So if you have this burden to be a teacher, part of what God has wired you to do is to, is to teach and use gifts to teach, but also in those schools to represent Jesus to those that you teach with, to the administration that you serve under, to the kids that you teach. If you have some other job or occupation, the, the bigger view that we all are to have is to make Jesus known. See, discovering Jesus and understanding that he's the Lord and Savior of our life comes with a responsibility now. So Emily, she already knew this before getting baptized, but she signed up and said, now I'm going to have this responsibility to tell other people about Jesus. People told me about Jesus. I was raised in a home that dedicated me as a child. My parents wanted me to have an understanding of this story. And more people have come along in my life and helped me to continue to understand the narrative and the story of Jesus Christ. And now I'm coming to a place where I own that for myself. And she got baptized. And I own that for myself, and I tell other people about it. That's what we have is a responsibility. And if you're not ready, you know, to, to take that step, um, the, the most important question for anybody here is, do you understand who Jesus is and what he's done for you? Do you understand his great love for you and why he died on the cross for you? Because once you take that step, then that responsibility comes. Don't ever try to carry that responsibility without understanding who Jesus is and his love and his grace for you. Because what you do for him cannot outdo what he's done for you on the cross. Um, What he's earned for forgiveness and grace 
by his death on the cross for you cannot be outdone by what we do for him, even all of us collectively. So what is God's purpose in the world? God's purpose in the world is for his glory and his fame and his love to be made known to everybody, that we would follow him and know him personally. Um, That is the first and most important question for all of us. Have you ever examined your priorities in your life through that question? Because if you haven't, you haven't yet fully started surrendering your life to Jesus. You haven't yet fully said, God, I am yours. I've been bought with a price. To fully follow God starts to see like the priorities of the Bible and of, that God has for me now become the priorities that I have. And so this is one of the most important priorities. If we want to be an owner versus a renter, do you want to have some stake in what God is doing in the world? What's God's purpose in the world? Question number one. Question number two, I said there's two. We're already halfway there. What gifts has God given you to share his hope with the world? I asked you already, I said, hey, is this clarity just Paul has it? You know, he's an apostle. God gave him words to write to people and like to help people understand what does it mean to follow Jesus. That's pretty unique calling. Not all of us have that type of calling. Um, but he does make it clear. Go back to Romans 12. So if you have your Bible open and you're in fi- chapter 15, turn a couple pages to the left and go to chapter 12 because we can all have this clarity. We can all have this sense of like, this is what God's called me to do. So I'm just going to answer this question with the Bible. Look at verse three in chapter 12. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, he's talking about the church. He says the church is one body. You guys know what a body is, right? There's a head, there's arms, there's feet, there's legs. And he's, he's thinking of the church, people like us in this room uh, as a body. As in one body, we have many members. So these many members are different. They don't have the same function. They don't all do the same thing. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Paul is like leveling the playing field here. He's saying like, hey, we're all in this together. You know, you don't need to follow me to follow Jesus. Uh, You know, we're all the church together. I don't view myself better than you. We're part of a team. Verse six, here's how the different functions Parts function. Having gifts that defer according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion with our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in his generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Do you think for people to do those things, they need to understand what gifts God's given them to do? Like, if, what if everybody tries to lead? Nobody follows. What if everybody just goes out and does acts of mercy? Nobody's leading. You know, and so there's different parts. And he's saying, some of you should be exhorting, but some of you would be scared to death to get on the stage and talk in front of people. Some of you are struggling to talk in a group right now. That's a small group. And, but there are people that aren't. Um, and they're exhorters. And so there's different types of gifts that God gives to the church. And so we need to have clarity by knowing what are the gifts that God's given to you? So I just want to ask you this question. If I were to come up to you this week and say, hey, what are your spiritual gifts? Would you be able to say one, two, three and rattle them off to me? Because if you can't, hopefully this will be helpful for you. If you can, pat yourself on the back. You're amazing. Um, but I want to introduce us all again, if you've heard this, but maybe for some of us the first time. These are the gifts that God writes about. And there's two parts of the Bible, mainly two parts. We're in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 uh, that he identifies these spiritual gifts. We could put, have them all up on the screen. That would be helpful. Um, and there's a number of different gifts. You can't see them all probably. It's written a little bit small, but if you open up your Bible and read, you'll see them listed out there. And I don't have time to go through all these different gifts. Um, but when you think about uh, what are your gifts, uh, if you don't know the answer to that question, I want to pastor you and help you know how you can have an answer to that question. And the first answer is you got to know, like, what's the list that we choose from? You know, there's lots of gifts in the world, right? You can, you can see a kid throw a football, you know, at a young age, be like, wow, he can throw. Um, a lot of kids can throw really good, but when they go and try out for their varsity team, if there's five of them, uh, only one can really play the game, right? And out of that one high school quarterback, how many make it to college to play? 
And then out of those college quarterbacks, how many make it to the NFL to play? You know, there's a certain guys that are in the NFL that have this convergence of, wow, not just people saying you're really good at this, but the ability to actually do it um, and the desire to do it. So when I think about gifts, I'm going to start with using just, you know, that, that analogy. Think about this Venn diagram. So I'm, I'm talking about gifts that are not spiritual. I'm just talking about, you know, athletic gifts. You know, like you might have a passion to be a quarterback when you grow up, or you might have a passion to be a singer. You know, if you grew up a couple decades ago and you watched American Idol, you saw a lot of people who had a passion to be a singer, but they didn't have the ability. You know, they, they got onto American Idol and they got embarrassed because they didn't have the ability. It's great that they had affirmation from their mom, but they didn't have more affirmation, right? And so you need the convergence of all of those. So just think about singing or sports, you know, the, the most recognizable, you know, gifts in our culture. You know, when you have the convergence of all three of these words, affinity, meaning I love doing this. You know, I love to do this one thing. And you have the ability, I'm actually good at it too. And you're not having your head in the clouds thinking that by yourself. You have people who actually say, you are good at that. The convergence of all of those together is a gift. Now, what we're talking about this morning is a spiritual gift because you're like, well, how does throwing a football help the church? Well, it doesn't really. Um, so uh, then what does help the church? You go back to that list and people who lead the church, people who encourage one another, people who do acts of mercy, people who serve, people who are generous, those are all different gifts that function together. And so my question is like, well, of those spiritual gifts, which ones do I have? And I want to point you to a tool. You can use that if you can go back to the uh, Venn diagram there. You can think about this and just look at the list and try to figure that out on your own. But you could also use another tool, which I really like and appreciate. It's called a GPS assessment. And so GPS, if you've heard GPS before, what does a GPS help us do? It helps us get to a, new, a location. We type in um, where we want to go, and it gives us the directions to how to get there. So there's a double meaning to GPS. If you take this assessment, meaning you go and you, take some, you answer some questions about your personality, about things that you're good at, um, what it will do is help take all this data, and it will spit out uh, a couple of possible gifts in your life. Uh, and, and GPS stands for Gifts, Passions, and story. So it's similar to those three A words. Uh, it is your gifts, the things that you're good at, your passions, the thing that you like to do, and your story. If you go back, I just had a friend take the GPS this past year, and when he took the story part, he was recognizing, oh, I've managed this in my past, and then when I went here, they put me in charge of managing and organizing this, and then when I went over here at my workplace, and he was looking at where his past church experience, his work experience, um, friends that have called him up and asked him for help, they're all asking him for help to manage and organize things. So maybe he's good at managing and organizing things, right? When he thinks about his story, when you think about your story, that you start to see some similar things. And so the GPS, uh, I'll put the website up there. It's a, it's a lot to put out there. But if you have, uh, if you're on our mailing list, if you fill out the connect card and get an email, we'll send it to you this week, just the link to the GPS where you can take it. It takes about 30 to 40 minutes to do. Because here's the most, you can't know how to own the church if you don't know what God's called you to do. So you need to understand what are my spiritual gifts? And so this is just a tool that helps you. You should probably do this with other people and share your answers with other people and say, this is how I'm wired. This is how God made me. This is the things that I'm passionate about, the things I think I'm good at. Um, and then invite other people into that process to affirm and help you, to help you be an owner. So do you know what your gifts are? Maybe you do. I said, pat yourself on the back. That's great. Next question is, are you using them? Are you showing up here on Sundays ready to use your spiritual gifts? Or are you just kind of renting? Um, are you showing up to your group and a group of people that you're following Jesus with and, and just kind of hanging out and going with the flow and having this renter mentality? Or are you bringing a sense of like, no, I, God wants me to help this church, these group of people in some way. God wants me to use my gifts in my community uh, on the team that I coach or the organization that I volunteer with to use these gifts with them. You see, are you using these gifts? Have you identified these gifts? I want to help you be an owner because that's what Paul is writing as he moves forward. You're supposed to instruct one another. You're supposed to function together as the church. And I want to give us a kind of a quick picture uh, we'll wrap up with uh, of what this looks like. So I need five volunteers to come up onto the stage. So uh, just, yeah, come on up. Uh, five people, right, raise their hands. Right, come on up, guys. Uh, this is going to be perfect. Um, you guys are great victims. I mean, great volunteers. 
to do this. You guys could stand right over here, all right? And I'm going to give you a job to do, all right? Uh, I'm going to tell you what people uh, on, on a fire truck do. So go ahead, stand all the way over there because this is where, be where the fire truck is. So does anybody want to be the operator of the truck, the, the driver of the truck? All right, come on up right here. So this is kind of our fire truck. You are driving the truck. It's a big wheel, okay? So you got to steer and be the siren too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to make the siren. We don't have a siren on this truck, so it has to be, you know, through your mouth. Can we get this microphone? We need a siren noise. So t tell her how, what a siren sounds like. There you go. There you go. Check, 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 check. Hello, hello, hello. It's, is it on? Good. Let me see there real quick. It is on. It is on. We're tapping it. There we go. Richard didn't want to hear your sign, I guess. Go ahead. <laughs> Wee -woo. Wee all right, all right, all right, great. Siren, that's the, that's the first one. We had the operator. Now we have somebody who likes to be in charge. Anybody like to be in charge? Hannah. Hannah, oh, dang. That was a lot of answers to that question. Hannah, you are in charge, all right? So Hannah, come on up, you're in charge. So what you're gonna do, just, just, I know you wanna be in charge, but you can't sit in front of the driver. <laughs> Is there any car where there's a seat in front of a driver? So sit next to the driver, okay? And so what you're going to do is you're going to turn around and, and like yell at people. Um, and so like, do this, do that. You're like, you're telling people, you're commanding them. And you're also, you, not right now, but you also break down all the doors. Um, and so that's part of your job is being in charge. All right, next, so you're the company officer, Nozzleman. Who wants to, all right, a Nozzleman right here. Nozzle woman, sorry. Nozzle woman, you're going to hold the hose. Like, what does the hose look like? All right, great. You're going to hold the hose. Just hold the hose right there. You don't have to say, actually, go, like, make a water coming out of a hose sound. All right, great. Awesome. So what are you again? The, the nozzle woman. Nozzle woman. All right, what are you again? Person in charge. Person in charge? Operator. Operator? Yeah. Operation? What do you do? Wee woo. And, and, and you drive the truck. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. And what do you do? Tell people what to do. Tell people what to do. And what do you do? All right, great. You put out the fire. We need somebody to hold the hose. All right, Marissa, you're going to hold the hose, all right? Because sometimes that hose goes out of control. You need to hold, hold it, make sure it doesn't get kinked. All right, so you're holding the hose. You don't have a noise. I'm sorry. All right. And so Tillerman, all right, I, was, I was at a parade this past year, and I saw a truck. Have you ever seen the trucks where there's a, two drivers? There's a driver in the back. That's so cool. And there's, because there's a gigantic ladder. And so you got to drive the back here. So you got another steering wheel. All right. But uh, we're going that way. So, all right. So I know you drive and you can go kind of any direction you want, but you still got to follow in the back um, and, and you're going to operate the ladder. All right. So what are you a Tillerman? Tillerman. And what do you do? Operate the bag. Okay. All right. Let's see how good these guys are. Let's, uh, on the count of three, do your job. One, and make the noises. Two, three. All right. Good. Hannah, that was awesome. You're, all right, good. So. Just answer me one more time. What is, what is it that you do? What are you doing? Well, I'm the driver. Okay, and what are you doing? Tell people what to do. All right, what are you doing? Putting out the fires at the wall. All right, what are you doing? The supporter of the house. All right, and what are you doing? Raise the ladder. All right, did they get the answers right? No. They got them all wrong. They're supposed to put out a fire. You see, when we talk about the spiritual gifts, stay here for a second. When we talk about the spiritual gifts, sometimes in America, we love who we are and what we do. We love what is, makes us special in this world, right? There's songs about how special we are and what it is I'm supposed to do. And we get caught up in thinking that that's what we're here to do. When Paul already said, question number one, what's your main purpose? It's to glorify God, to know him forever, to enjoy him, to make him known. That is what we do. Their job is to put out a fire. I set you up for that. I'm sorry. So can we thank them? Go ahead. Their job is to put out a fire. Our job goes back to that first question. To make God known. Because he is worthy of being known by every person. And if you don't know God this morning, this is the most important question for any of us to wrestle with. Am I in a right relationship with God? I was made to know him, to be known by him. Or am I living a life separate from him? If you have placed your faith in God, are you an owner of this mission? 
Take the GPS assessment this week. Start using whatever gift it is. Just start trying. If you don't even know what to do, start working with other people. Put on the connect card. Like, hey, I want to volunteer. I want to help out. I want to figure this out. Send me some more information. We'd be glad to help you. Or get in a discipling relationship. Emily talked about being in a discipling relationship where she's learning about what does it mean to follow Jesus when she reads parts of the Bible that she doesn't understand. She's got people in her life that she can ask questions to. I don't get this. All of us should have that same opportunity in our life. There's a couple of people who took the GPS last year in 2020. A lot of people did. All, we took all of our leaders through this. Um, and it was a couple, and both of them had uh, the gift of hospitality. It wasn't news to them. They had taken other assessments and stuff before, but they had the gift of hospitality, which means that's one of the spiritual gifts. Uh, just, you know, when you go over somebody's home and they make you feel incredibly welcomed and like they want you to be there. Uh, and that, that's the gift of hospitality. People who are just are able to do that. Um, and during the pandemic, uh, they were gathering, and many of us were gathering outside um, at Hannah Moore Park. But as soon as it got too cold, we came inside here. Um, but our number cut in half. Only half of the people that were outside at Hanamore Park felt comfortable coming inside in November of last year. And the other half started watching at home. And this couple started watching at home. Uh, and as the pandemic progressed um, and things, they started to feel more comfortable maybe having somebody over to their house as different numbers change, they invited friends over to their house and they started to watch United together. Um, they would spend not just two hours at church on Sunday, it was like three to six hours. They would not just watch, but they would like have a meal. It was like a whole long day, but they had the gift of the hospitality. And so they were good at doing that. And they started you know, to do that in the beginning of February, January, um, and to gather with these friends. And then they invited another couple um, into that. And in some time, they started to experience their own fellowship. They were also leaders of a group where they had um, about 20, up to 20 people in the past year to their group. Uh, and those other 20 aren't part of United. It's other people that have joined into that Thursday night group. In this couple, a lot of you have been here from the very beginning, know them, because there's, there's six of them and their children that are gathering together. Uh, and the, f the first couple that have the gift of hospitality is Charles and Nikki Fisher. And so you know Charles, many of you, as he taught here at United in our early years uh, before the pandemic hit. Charles was also known as the coffee man. You could always find him with a mug in his hand and serving coffee because he has the gift of encouragement too. And he just likes to volunteer and serve people, give coffee away, encourage people, brighten their day. That's his spiritual gifts. That's his wiring. He knows what he's supposed to do. And Charles is an owner at United Church, has been from day one, volunteering, serving, using his gifts. Um, Nikki also served in hospitality. Uh, we have a picture of her with an apron on and, and, uh, and serving, serving, serving coffee here. Uh, and, and then Jerry and Erica was that couple that they invited over. Uh, it's a family picture of Jerry and Erica and their kids. Uh, Jerry was an awesome small group leader here um, pre-COVID in the environment that we had at Owings Mills High School. And he led um, some of the elementary uh, students. Uh, and then Erica also started uh, in kids, but she learned that her gift makeup uh, was more of being like Hannah, you know, the director, telling people what to do, where to go, what to be. And so she started to like be a director in production and, and started to like um, help direct and take care of a lot of details. And so she did that for a number of years here at United. She helped us get moved into this facility here. Uh, Carson and Savetta, harder to find a picture of these guys and that fits their personality um, because they don't like to be seen or visible. Uh, and so like, so we, if you zoom on that picture, there they are right up there. We we got you guys. We, we got you. And, uh, and so Sveta started with the parking team, but then found out it was all guys, and she moved over to hospitality. And then, and then Carson, if you just think about this high top table and think of energy drinks sitting at that high top table, uh, that was a picture of Carson most Sundays as he put slides up onto the screen and served in our team. These six guys have been serving from the very beginning at United. And you're probably saying, well, why are you talking about them this morning? is because as they've gathered together uh, in their church, they've gotten clarity on what God's called them to do. They've gotten clarity on not just their gifts, but on what God's called them to do and who God's called them to do that with. 
And, and we are this morning wanting to send them off because sometimes when people are part of your church, especially Charles, Charles was incredibly visible. Like, hey, whatever happened to that Charles guy? Uh, well, we're telling you what happened to that Charles guy. And we're telling you what happened with all six of these guys um, and their kids as they are starting a house church together. Uh, over on the east side of Baltimore, northeast side of Baltimore, and called Fireside Fellowship. And we are wanting to send them off and pray for them. But first, we want to show you a little bit of what it looks like for their experience of church on a Sunday morning. Um, and also, similar to United, they have community partners. They like to come alongside and serve other community partners. Uh, and you'll see that in this video. And then I'll have a couple questions for them. We're going to pray for them. Uh, and so check out the video, and you guys can come up towards the end of the video. my community that's what I call community you know what I'm saying I could not have done that without Charles Fisher a stranger out of nowhere that was bringing gallons and buckets and gallons had everything we needed um, uh, he had to drill just in case of this and you know he just was so happy I'm mean, happy to help him and his group um, Big Jerry and Nikki and I think it was Irma and baby um, baby Jerry <laughs> and Lucian, you know, they all I mean, I don't I don't I've never met these people, but they helped me set up and, and get ready for everything I needed. And I, I mean, it was just um, beautiful. And I want to say thank you so much. Thank you so, so, so much, y'all. Right. So, um, are you guys trying to get people to come for the food? I saw all these pictures <laughs> of really good food. I just want to remind everybody here, we have free food next week, so free hot dogs, hamburgers. Give us a little context to the video and some of the pictures, what we're seeing there, what's been happening with you Sure. Guys. So, what we've been doing is we've, we've really embraced where... When you have like uh, the story of Jesus sitting around with his disciples and you have Jesus and Mary and Martha and one of them's running around doing all kinds of stuff and keeping really busy and then the other one is sitting at Jesus' feet. And as a house church, we've just kind of embraced that, sitting into that and leaning into that where we can just discuss the Bible together as a group and lean into our relationship with Jesus and together just leaning into that and choosing that moment and just kind of sitting around a fire, talking about Jesus, talking about our faith, talking about life, because life happens, mm -hmm. <laughs> and being able to just discuss that and lean into that every week. And we do that around food. We usually have a lot of food. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Uh, tell us um, 
So some of the pictures there, uh, tell us about the lady that was sharing Ceasefire. So we had never met her before. We the Ceasefire, if you're not familiar with Baltimore Ceasefire, it happens four times a year. We're actually currently in a Ceasefire weekend right now. And so four times a year, different communities, get, different community advocates get together and they try to just promote uh, life in our community and in our city and try to really just promote life um, affirming events. And so we were actually gearing up to do a service week with, United, but United was serving like the weekend before. And so we were going to do something in our community the weekend before to be a part of United and what United was doing. And, and everything fell through. Like every time we'd get close to like, the, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. We'd be like, well, that's not going to work. Well, we'll do this instead. That's not going to work. Well, we'll do this instead. And then it poured down rain. And we're like, well, we're not doing that either. And then we're like, well, why don't we just jump in on ceasefire and help with ceasefire? So I reached out to somebody I had not met. And I said, hey, I saw that you had this event. I saw that you asked for bottles of water what can we do? And they were like, yeah, we need bottles of water. So we just showed up and was like, here's what we got. And then I was like, what else can we do? And they were like, you could help us set up. And we're like, all right. So we like, we rallied, we showed up, it was a Sunday afternoon. And we're like, hey, guess what? Church is happening in the park today. So we went over to the park for this water battle and the community, we helped set up this whole community thing. And they didn't know us from anybody, but we were the first ones there. We actually, we were there before they were there. And we showed up and we were just there all day, just whatever they needed. We were there. And then they realized that their permits got mixed up and so we had set everything up and then their permits were messed up and we had to move it and so we had to tear it down and we moved it <laughs> out into the field and we just moved everything down and yeah. we were just there for it and so it was kind of cool and they were like we don't even know you and then at one point that woman that you saw was the leader of the event and she didn't know us but she was like all right i gotta run an errand you guys are in charge <laughs> it's like they didn't have a next person up so we were just the next person in charge and she had been in the hospital. That was what we didn't know, is that leading up to that event, she'd been planning this event and then ended up in the hospital and didn't know how she was going to make the event happen. And so that was all a God thing about how we didn't serve the one weekend. And then we put all of our stuff. We're like, all right, we'll just help this. And she was like, I didn't know how I was going to make this event happen because yeah. I've been in the hospital for a week and didn't know how I was going to make it go. So yeah. cool. it worked out cool. How can we be praying for you guys? And as we, this morning, we want to send you off well. You know, sometimes people leave churches for a variety of reasons. You know, they move out of the area. Maybe they stop following Jesus and say, this isn't for me anymore. Uh, and there's good and bad reasons. And this is a good reason where people are going. They're embracing the mission, owning it personally in a different way. Um, so how can we pray as you guys take this step and we kind of formally pray for you, send you off? Uh, and uh, as you embrace this mission even more how can we pray for you specifically what does that look like for us as to be a church that supports you guys so the big prayer request would be that we are leaning into what feels unknown in some ways we've served in ministries for a variety of years my wife and i've been married for 16 years and we've served in vocational ministry for 14 of those years in some kind of leadership role and this is different than anything we've ever served in before. And so we're leaning into the fact that it's different, but we need prayer for that. We need support for that because we're leaning into, all right, we want to dive into what the Bible says. We want to, you know, if we have a tradition that we're like, hey, we do this every week, we're going to dissect it together as a group. And so we want to be faithful to what the Bible asks us and commands us to do in order to serve Jesus and serve God. But at the same time, we're leaning into what feels a little bit unfamiliar in some ways. And a lot of times it's really comfortable, and then sometimes it's not always comfortable, because you're like, but this is what we know, so we should just do this. And we're like, well, we're not going to just do that because we know it. Yeah. We're going to do that because we have studied the Bible together, and we're like, well, the Bible says we should do it, so we're going to continue to do it. Or we study it, and then we're like, maybe we don't need to do that anymore. And so that's the stuff that we really need a lot of prayer for, because we want to faithfully follow Jesus in our community, and we want that to be able to show out in our lives, because that might not mean that people are invited to our house every time. It might just mean we're together, getting stronger, and then when we go out to our jobs, and when we go out in the community, that we're seen that way. So things just feel different. And so praying for us to be faithful while we lean into what's different and uncomfortable is what's going to be good. That's great. Awesome. Hey, same way we pray for Emily this morning. How don't we just uh, spread our hands to these guys? We're just going to take a moment to pray for them, okay? God, we just thank you so much uh, for these families. We thank you for these friends. Uh, and God, we ask that, uh, just as Charles shared, that as they lean into you uh, in a new way uh, this season, opening up the Bible uh, on Sunday mornings as they gather, studying the Bible, what does it say for them to follow Jesus in this new way as a house church? I pray that they would hear your voice. I pray that everything they read in the Bible, they'd submit their lives to and they'd follow with all of their hearts and they continue to make Jesus known 
uh, not just to each other, but uh, to the people and places that they go to throughout the week. Lord, we pray for your spirit to breathe life into their house church, that it would be an environment um, where uh, people are loved well, people are cared for well, and where Jesus is made known um, to each person. And so we just pray for um, your guidance and your spirit to guide and direct them. And we just pray, God, that they would see people come to faith in Jesus as a result of uh, starting this new church uh, that meets in the Fisher home. We just pray that people would be baptized, whether it's in their bathtub or they borrow our feeding trough here, Lord, they, that people would get baptized as a result of their faithfulness to share Jesus in their communities and their, with their friends. And so, God, we just pray for them now. We thank you for them. And we, we pray all this in the great name of Jesus Christ. Amen.